I'm really excited because I'm I want your class so much. I've been attracted by your vibrant images and your use of the light and how you get that on the paper. So that's why I want to take the classes and be mentored from you. And well, we thank have, you. I appreciate that. We have our oh. classes starting November 2nd at 5 p.m. Which and is I, uh yeah, which is is that two in weeks? a few weeks. Two weeks. A few weeks, I said. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. be out of town between now and uh, then. I guess it's three. Is it three weeks or three weeks away? I think we're just two weeks away. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, we leave town next Friday. And I was just telling my husband earlier, you know, we're leaving next week. And he's, oh, my gosh, is it that time already? <laughs> uh where are you going uh up to Sedona we always go up uh it's not, it's only a couple hours away not even that really but we always go up there for our anniversary week oh, which is oh. October the 30th is our anniversary so nothing nice mm -hmm. art just nice stuff yeah I don't have to sing for my supper I just have to go and just relax <laughs> Awesome. Have I'll fun. take my painting stuff with me, though. Oh, you do? Oh, I always do, yeah. Always. Yeah. Awesome. And when you're there and talking about what you were going to say you're doing tonight, do you just do the sketches or do you do the full, would you do a full painting while you're away? Uh, well, it just depends on what I have time for. So um, I have something I can show you. There's one scene. Uh, hold on just a second. I'll be right back. So there, it's right on the, it's right on the creek. <clears throat> and so I started this in 2021 and didn't finish it. So the next year, last year I went, we went back, we stay at the same place. So I took it back with me and I did some more <laughs> and it's still not finished. So I might take it back and do a little bit more to it. Hopefully finish it this time. This wow. is a, you could probably tell this is an oil painting. And the, there was one that, and then there was another one I did sitting at the same spot, but angled in a different direction. <clears throat> and I actually did finish that one that last year. So that one took two years to do. Just two set, two um, years, but not the whole year, just, <laughs> you know, that you, few days that I was there. You won't take your sketch or your photo, take it home and finish it at home. You go back and use the real scene. Oh, no. <clears throat> it just so happens that, uh, that for those particular two paintings, I never had time to work on them at home. So I just took them back with, with me. I have so many th paintings that I start as demonstrations I have stacks and stacks of paintings that I'll never have a chance to finish. So those were just two that I just didn't have time to work on. So I worked on the one and finished it last year. And this one, hopefully I'll finish it, finish it this year. I don't think it's, I want to keep it really moody. So I don't think it's going to have much left to do. I have pictures. I could finish it here in the studio if only I had time. I just don't. It's all about time. Yep. Okay. And this one that I was going to work on uh, as part of my demo this evening, it's one I started also. See, here's another one I started that will never be finished. So I put something on the back. So this was started last year demonstrating for a group. And then another group I had to do a demo for. So then I started it again. So now I have a couple of different stages I can I can oh. work on as part of my demo this evening. So one of these days, I think I would like to finish this one. But we'll see. And the one on the back is discarded. You just don't want to finish it? I don't have time and it's not. I, not. I don't really... It, um, um, uh, I didn't, I don't think I got the perspective quite right. This one also has a peony on the back that I probably won't ever finish. So maybe I'll finish one side. I don't know. 
I think it's cool if somebody buy when somebody buys that, then you know you can they can flip it over and see in bonus one. They get a twofer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if the other one ever gets finished, that has happened. Yeah, and she told me she was going to frame it so that she could flip it, but I don't know if she ever did or not. I'll have to find out one of these days. <laughs> I think she's in my afternoon class, as a matter of fact. Some things just go right out of my memory and other things kind of hang around. Okay. Oh, um, one more question before you get going with your demo. You had mentioned on your page, it says that your expertise is technical, your speciality. So what, what does no, that mean? No, I don't. No. That, I didn't, if, I, if that one got checked, that was a total accident. I didn't ever purposefully check that because no if you're if you're talking about like uh technical abilities with devices no oh, for your teaching <laughs> that's not my okay so we'll have to change that out then what do you th say your specialty is um as far as my paintings yeah as subject matter? mentorship at all anything uh, well, rocks and water are my favorite to uh, topic to paint. Um, as far as uh, teaching, I think my um, strong suit is that I can break it down into manageable chunks that makes it easier for the, the student to grasp. That's important. So um, I don't know, maybe maybe it's technique rather than technical, but I'm not a super technique-y painting. Uh, basically, I try to um, simplify and push the colors beyond what you see and make it a little more atmospheric than what you see, stuff like that. Okay. Which is your use of light. Like that's what I see when I see your paintings is. Oh, um, well, making sure you know where the light source is and being consistent. Hmm. So yeah. I do try to break it all down into the most simple components possible. Okay, awesome. So the first thing I was going to do was do a slide presentation or, you know, a screen share. Yeah. So... Uh, do I have that ability? Yes, it looks like I do. So, yeah. So um, just let me know when we're starting. I don't know if you're going to do an introduction or I don't know how we're going to start. I thought that was kind of it. Oh, was that <laughs> it? <laughs> <Another intro. laughs> okay, that works for me. <laughs> you're an amazing award-winning artist. You do oil, acrylic, and watercolor paintings. Well, uh, acrylic most of the time is used as an adjunct to either oil or watercolor. I don't really consider myself an acrylic painter per se, but I will, I, you know, I will use it when I'm asked to demonstrate. But I really do uh, consider myself a watercolor and oil painter more than, more than any other mediums. Do you mix the, ever mix the watercolor and oil? Yes, actually I do. The one I just showed you, mm -hmm. um, that, that's still to be finished, uh, that was started with a watercolor block in. So if I'm play, painting in plain air and I really can't take the oils with me because there's a little bit more to uh, taking oil paints with you to a plain air site than there is watercolor. Uh, so what I do is just coat my canvas uh, with watercolor ground, either Daniel Smith or Golden. And um, then that gives me the opportunity to paint on that canvas with watercolor uh, because it grabs the watercolor. <clears throat> you can put the ground on, on glass even, not as a fine art thing, I wouldn't think, but you can even put the ground on glass. Uh, and then that allows you to paint on that glass or whatever you've applied it to with watercolor. Because the ground is an acrylic um, medium, you can also paint on it with oil. 
So I will do the block in often with the watercolor and then in the studio when I have the oil paints, then I can just finish it off as an oil painting. Cool. Nice background then. Um, some of the watercolor is still showing through. Yeah. After you get some, uh, you know, some impasto or, <coughs> excuse me, um, oil paint on that has, you know, it has some texture, a little bit of thickness. You really can't see anymore uh, the watercolor. It just looks like it's all, all goes together. Any more than you could see uh, and be able to separate the, the, um, of the oil block in. So are you an oil painter? You are, aren't you? No. Oh, you're not an oil painter. Um, well, I could show you this real quick because I think we have, we always have some prospective members of our group uh, to be uh, painters and other mediums other than watercolor. So this is my uh, book on oil painting. It's the most recent book that I have. Uh, but anyway, on, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter five, I have um, taken the same basic composition and painted it using different uh, methods of beginning an oil painting. So the first one is a standard block in. I'll hold it up close so you can see. So with a standard block in, um, I generally use trans uh, oil paint transparently. But in this case, I've got some transparent and some opaque, but it's just blocking the whole composition in. It's not finishing any part of it. And then it shows how the steps go uh, along to the finished painting that is finished in, you know, just with a combination of transparent and opaque, but more or less opaque because well, uh, oil is considered an opaque medium. And then the, the next one uh, I've done using a um, monochromatic underpainting, which mm. is kind of like a block in. It's not um, that much different. It's just that it's only using one color. And again, I did use it uh, transparently, possibly a little opaque thrown in. And then it goes on to show the final painting. The third one is direct painting, where at every point, um, and this is, um, I can't, because these were meant for this chapter in this book, I really strictly adhered to that uh, theme of keeping it finished as I go along. In a real painting, you know, if I'm not doing it as a demonstration or for a book, I might not, I, I might not finish it. I might kind of do a mix and match type of a thing. Uh, but the way that it is a direct painting is that in the final painting, this is the same as it was at the as it was several steps earlier. So I finished it before going on and then finished that and then finished as I went. So that would be the direct method. So that's what I mean by a block in. You could also do the watercolor as a monochromatic um, underpainting. But anyway, that may have been a little bit more than you actually wanted to know about um, using watercolor and oil together, but that's the way I do it. That's cool. Yeah, actually, I'm not even a watercolor painter. So I just started with acrylics. And I just love your work, so I'm going to learn. Oh, great. And with acrylic, you know, you can treat it like watercolor and oil. So when I uh, when I teach it in a class, I I'll, often I'll have a class with um, multiple mediums, not more than those three, just those three. So I might say, okay, now if you're an acrylic painter and we're doing, uh, and I'm giving you a watercolor 
demonstration, just realize that the acrylic can be used exactly the way as I'm going to do this demonstration. And then I move to the oil and I'll say the acrylic is going to be used the same way as the oil. There are some differences, of course, because of uh, the fact that acrylic dries so fast. And so I might do a totally acrylic painting just so that people can see um, that there still is a difference between acrylic and oil. But um, paint is paint. You know, the biggest challenges are really uh, shape and value and color. So everything applies to everything. Okay. So is it time for me to do my screen share? Yeah. Well, your screen share is up. Is, oh, it's not yet. No. Okay. Uh, so I've got it queued up. Let's see if it will cooperate with me. You bet. And yes, there it is. So this isn't the one I wanted to show to begin with, though. Oh, I queued it up and then it's, uh, now it's gone. Okay, wait a minute. There it, it is. Yeah. I've just got all these other little boxes, all these little windows in front. Because the first one I was going to show is this one. Um, need to make it bigger. There we go. So this painting is uh, a watercolor. It will be. It, it turned out to be a watercolor painting, I should say. This happens to be the coolest, crazy structure in Laguna Beach on the California coast. And um, so my, my daughter had taken this picture and sent it to me. And then when I visited her, we went there and I went the wrong direction. Shoot, let me get, I gotta get these faces out of the way so I can go back. So that, so when we went back again, that was a picture I took. So the picture I took, the tide was in. And so you can see some wave action. And I'm combining this one with this one because there's no waves, but look at the cool shadows. Uh, so anyway, I mentioned earlier, maybe before we actually started. So let me just say again that... Um, I really try to break things down into their most simplified components to make it easier, not only for people in class to, to know what I'm doing and I can explain, et cetera, and they can follow, but also for my own, for my own use because I also get confused and, okay, now what do I do, et cetera, et cetera. So I really like to... Uh, break things down. And one of the things that I feel is part of that process is doing preliminary studies. This happens to be my favorite right now, which I call the four-step sketch. And so it doesn't take very long to do. And I will demonstrate that uh, a little bit later after I get done with this screen share. So there's my simple sketch. Oops, it went past. There we go. Uh, then I do the light values, and then the medium values, and then the final darks. So this really doesn't take very long. It's not about technique. It's just about seeing the simple shapes, uh, the simple values, light, medium, and dark, the simple colors, because we mm -hmm. use only four colors, one red, one yellow, and two blues. And that simple light to dark watercolor approach. And so then here's the, the real painting, which I call the real painting. Now, sometimes my sketches uh, turn out um, well enough that I could actually call them a painting. And other times they, they don't turn out well at all. They're not attractive at all. In fact, they can be rather ugly. But when I see that and I realize that I'm not happy, then I have to tell myself or ask myself the question, um, did it do its job? Its job isn't to be pretty. Its job is to teach me about the painting to come and help me figure out some of the, the downfalls I might be facing, et cetera. So anyway, there's a big difference in the drawing. The drawing for the real painting is more carefully thought out. 
um, probably a little more detail. Um, and then I don't strictly adhere to that simple process. Each step is more nuanced. In this case, I used a little bit of masking fluid to make sure I had a few of the uh, spots of white for the foam. Um, then it went on to some medium values. Uh, you can see my arrow here that I can use as my pointer. So it doesn't strictly follow the rules that I set myself for the, the sketch. Um, sometimes I'll let this one carry into the darks um, before doing the mediums, let's say for the entire picture plane. Um, anyway, um, I think that's, is that the, there's the final, there's the final painting. So I kept it loose and the um, study done ahead of time did help with that. So now I'm going to go back to this one. This shows, uh, now this is a picture that I kind of cobbled together by taking a, a creek scene that I had from another painting and putting it into this pretty fall foliage area. I don't do that very often, but I had a vision. And so I structured the uh, pictures so that I had something to uh, look at while I was painting. And um, the what I wanted to point out for this one, and I think I went, I wanted to show the final painting first uh, because um, this was an oil painting. Started with an underpainting of acrylic. And I hope you can see in this picture, yeah, I started with, an, um, by toning the canvas with a, a metallic iridescent bronzy color in acrylic. And then on top of that, I did the, sketch with uh, paint, just with my paint and brush, and then started in with the uh, opaque paint and took it to its conclusion. I think this is the final, the final version. But what I wanted to say was a couple steps back, perhaps even further back than this, somewhere in this area at this point, I started, um, my brain started acting like it tr was trying to be a camera. And I was looking at my picture and trying to figure out how to do all those leaves. And then I realized, well, I'm not, I'm not a painter of leaves. I'm a painter of shapes that look like leaves later simply because of the shapes. So at that point, I stopped and I went back and did... Uh, two quick sketches. I did a watercolor sketch. Here's the sketch, the light, the medium, and then the dark. Trying to get the composition in my mind and realizing that I didn't have to paint leaves in order to get that fall foliage impression. Um, and then I did one in oil too, just on paper, because it's not meant to be a painting. And this turned out to be just three steps, just a quick um, brush sketch of some branches and the main composition, and then uh, medium values. And then this is it, the medium values shown in black and white, so you can see the values. Now, I just left the white of the paper as the light. Uh, but then in this step, then I added uh, added some light value paint, uh, like um, white with a little bit of yellow mixed in for the sky, uh, some yellow with white mixed in it for the um, foliage, and just some pure white for the water. And then there it is in black and white. Uh, just to loosen up and get a better grasp in my mind of the basic uh, composition I was trying to uh, accomplish. 
And the fact that I didn't want any of this to show leaves per se, I wanted it to just be color and value with some branches that would help the viewer to see what the subject was. So um, I hope what I just showed you made sense. Before I stop sharing, did you have any questions possibly for what I meant? Or any questions at all, uh, Carrie Jo? No, it made sense. And I love your other studies. Um, there, you know what? I my, I'm going to stop sharing. My um, thought is that um, you really do need to learn how to do the studies. And maybe they'll take a little time at first. But learn to do them so that you can do them very quickly. Once you can do them in 15, 20 minutes, then they become fun. And because they're fun, then you'll do them. And then they'll help you. I know so many times people don't want to do the studies because they really labor over them because they haven't learned how to do them quickly. So they labor over them. And then at the end of this process of a long, uh, drawn out study, they're done. They're tired of the whole they're tired of the whole composition, want to move on. So the study hasn't really helped them. So I do think you have to put in the work so that they become quick and you can do them and then move on to the real painting. But the second painting I showed you was, uh, I, I like to show that because People will ask me, well, do you always do a study? Do you always do this study or that study? Or which study do you always do? Well, sometimes I don't. I'll just jump into the painting without doing a preliminary study. And then uh, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. And so often I find myself in trouble. And then I will say, oh, my goodness, you know what? You didn't do any preliminary work at all. What problem are you having? And what study will help you get through that problem and on to finish the painting? Okay. So um, the, what I'm going to actually demonstrate on, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate on this as time permits. But what I wanted to start with was showing you um, that four-step sketch and how quick and fun it can be. Um, and of course, I always hope that it will work. <laughs> Sometimes they look horrible. This is my photo. <clears throat> uh, see, I'll hold it so you can see it a little bit closer. Mm -hmm. And I really try to come up with a picture that I can, that lends itself to simplification. Uh, let's see, I did want to. What did I do with those pictures? Because I wanted to show you the original picture. This was a, from a hike we did last fall. And so I, as we do this hike, I've done it a um, gazillion times. It's so beautiful. But pictures, of course, never really do it justice. So this was the picture. And I decided I really wanted to focus on that portion of it. And so I um, cropped it and flipped it and intensified the values a little bit so that it's not so washed out looking. And I thought this would be a good composition and, that I could simplify. And I did do the four step sketch before. That's what I came up with. And that uh, that showed me that, yes, I will be able to do this composition as a painting. It's not a painting yet. This not, isn't bad, but it doesn't really satisfy me. I really want to get in there and use some of the watercolor techniques that we have at our disposal, uh, such as... The difference being, um, I use some splatter here to get the um, to get that white water, and that's negative splatter, not positive. 
And what else did I, oh, I used some salt. Uh, oh, there we go. So I used some salt. Gives you a pretty uh, texture. I used some masking fluid to make sure I caught the light on the branches. I did this a couple of different times. This one hasn't been taken as far as the other one, but you can still see the masking fluid on there. It's been on there for a long time, but I think it'll still come off. I used brighter colors, but it's basically the same composition. So we have techniques and materials and stuff at our disposal to take um, take a composition as long as it's got good bones and give it more atmosphere, you know, do, oh, uh, creative color, etc. But right now, I just want to get a feel for what is in front of me. Um, so this is not about technique. This is just about getting the bare bones on there in a simplified way. Um, so I'm going to try to do this real quick. So I, I know this probably is not going to be, it's not going to be all that attractive probably, but that's not it. That's not its job, right? So there's the, the big boulder. There's the tree. And I can promise you that when I do a drawing, I spend a lot more time. I can spend, I don't know, an hour or two just getting the drawing the way I want it to be. So I'm when I'm as I'm doing this, I'm also <clears throat> doing a lot of squinting. When you and when I say squinting, I don't really mean um, scrunching your face up. What I mean is lowering your eyelids. There's that main waterfall. Let's see, it comes down there. Oh, the other thing I did with this picture, uh, I took a waterfall from another picture and cloned it in because I really wanted a waterfall there. There wasn't much of one in the original picture. So there's the, there's the waterfall, there's a rock, there's the, the bubbling water coming away from it. There's a, the roots kind of coming out. There's a rock here. Uh, that's it. That's all I'm going to do for the sketch. I did make sure my palette had plenty of paint. I should be in good shape. Oh, there's my brush. So as oh, this is about an eight by ten. The tablet's nine by twelve. But when I do a study, I almost always put a box within the page. I call it the um, artificial picture plane, and it helps me to see the composition a little better. So simple sketch now. Uh, simple steps. So I'm going to use one yellow. It doesn't have to be the same yellow. Sometimes I'll use a different yellow, but these uh, primary colors work pretty well together. So I'm going to use one red. That is Scarlet Lake. I'm going to use two blues. I'm using Cerulean Blue because of its quiet, um, safe, uh, granulating nature. But it will not give you darks. So when the, for the dark darks, I'm going to need a dark blue. So Prussian blue will give me the added value that I need. So I think I've got this set up so you can see my tablet and my palette at the same time. Nice, yes. Um, so I'm not going to try to invent anything. I'm just looking at the picture, and I see a really bright 
yellow green and the foliage here. So I'm just going to, oh, and I'm using a wide flat brush. So if you've taken my classes before, you've heard me say this a gazillion times. Um, the reason for using a wide flat brush for this is that in addition to those other things I said that I'm studying and simplifying, uh, it's also a, a way for me to loosen up a little bit. And when you have your beautiful round pointed brush that we all treasure so much, and you want to be looser, and you keep telling yourself, this time I swear I'm going to be loose. This time I swear I'm going to make myself be loose. That loose idea in your head, that vision, travels down your arm, through the brush, and out into that little beautiful point and becomes a little idea. So because I don't have a point here, it helps me keep my ideas loose and larger. I hope that makes sense. It might sound a little weird, but that's the way I think about it. There's some orange up here. Just put uh, maybe a little needs a little more red. Just put it where it belongs, not trying to be uh, creative. It's actually there. There's also some yellow up in the upper left hand corner. And then there's a lot of gray. So I'm just going to add the cerulean blue to that warm red to get a grayish color. And again, just going to put it where it belongs. So when it comes to value, uh, we're looking at value in both overall and relative. So uh, by that, what I mean is, let me get let me get my lights on here, and then I'll show you what I mean. Let's see. There's a little bit of gray there, and it doesn't have to be. And I, you can see I'm not using any brush technique per se, just just putting the shapes where they belong um, as I see it. I think the bottom of that waterfall needs to have a little bit of value. So when we do these light values, we're actually getting light. We're saving the white. If it needs to save, if, it, if we need white, we're saving it. And then we're putting the next uh, darkest value on, which is light. So I'm trying, and we also have to realize that um, this paint is going to dry about 30% lighter. Let's see. Looks like I might have gotten a little bit into the medium. I didn't mean to. Sometimes that just happens. That's a little bit darker than I really meant it to be. Uh, so let's just get rid of it. Try to keep things as close to what I said they were going to be as possible. And you can see that this is definitely not the time to get precious with this. So I'm going to uh, say that's my light. You can see it didn't take very long. So if you look at the entire picture, the lightest light is the bubbles here and maybe a little bit in the streams of water. So we want to save the white and everything else is light, medium, and dark. So I'm putting the light on and the next step will be the mediums and then the dark. So now for the medium, same colors. Now I'm trying to go pretty fast with this because I want to get to the real painting so you can see some of that um, the technique that I would use in the real painting. So I still have not used any of the dark 
uh, blue. And I'm, so I'm still using the same colors, just taking it up to the next value. Or I should say down to the next value. We usually think of, of uh, darks as being uh, lower in value. You know, high key, low key. So this probably looks kind of dark. But remember that it's going to dry about 30% lighter. Also, don't forget that right now we're comparing this value to lights and mediums that are lighter than this value right here. So we don't have any darks for comparison. So once we put the true darks on here, then we'll really be able to see that these aren't really that dark. And I say, don't forget, don't forget to squint. So you can see the big shapes and not get caught up in the detail. You know, I'll probably get caught up in some detail uh, in the finished painting, but that's that'll be then, this is now. Right now, I'm trying to keep it uh, loose and strictly following the guidelines that I have set out for myself. And you're free to ask questions anytime, Carrie Jo. If anything I'm saying doesn't really make sense, just let me know. I'm just watching. So, I haven't tried that stuff. So, but I'm all keen. I have a little creek here with some waterfalls in it. So, and I uh, thought it was way too complicated to even attempt. Well, so, it, is, it is a complicated subject, but it's my favorite. And so I've studied it more than anything else. And, um, Practice really helps you to learn, you know, about the subject and learn, help you learn to simplify, et cetera. So let's see, I'm looking around carefully. I don't have that much medium in this painting. Um, oh, I didn't put this branch in. And so I didn't, for the sketch, I didn't save any light for the tops of the branches because this is just a sketch. It's not important to do. Now I spend more time with the mediums than I do the other two values. This ha actually holds true for my sketches. And my real paintings, I would say. So you could, I, I can see why somebody would think, well, that's really more than one step. And it's, you know, all about perception as well. In my mind, I'm perceiving this as all being mediums. Because I know what's, I know what, the, what uh, values are coming up. So, all right. So I'm going to call that done as far as the medium. So I'm going to use the same exact colors for the dark. Let's put some more out on the palette. But now I'm going to add that second blue. And now I'll be able to get dark. Now, <clears throat> I usually try to stick with the um, the wide flat brush as long as I can. But if I find that I, I just need a round brush for these final little darks, uh, I, I do give myself permission to do that. Um, but I still kind of try to keep to the the wide flat, it's not that wide, it's a three quarter inch aquarelle, 
uh, because I know from experience that as soon as I get that pointed brush in my hand, I'm going to have to really fight uh, to keep it from getting tight. That's just me. I know I know what's coming. Uh, so it might be something that I can really focus on using pretty brush strokes with the round in the final painting, but I don't want to spend that kind of time on this. I just want this to be kind of down and dirty. So I'm looking at the branches. Let's see, there's maybe a little dark accent right there. Uh, I don't want to overdo it with the darks. I do have a tendency to, to do just that. So always trying not to. Maybe a little bit in here, but not much. So for this demonstration, I think that's fine. So show you if now if I did 10 of these, I'd have 10 different ones. I mean, they, uh, none of them would be the same. This isn't the actual sketch. This is just a photo of it. But you can see they're pretty pretty similar. So the test then is to squint and look at the picture, the photo, and the sketch and see if in some fashion did I capture the uh, the essence or you know the um, impression of this scene. Did I get the bare bones? If I did, then that's great. If I didn't, if I really went haywire, I could always do another one. But it doesn't take very long. And I personally find these to be a lot of fun. So before I move on, are there any questions then about this? No, how many will you do in general before you do your painting? Oh, Probably not more than one of those four step. If I get into the painting and find, let's say it's a herd of cattle and I'm just not doing a good job on painting a cow, I might stop and do a painting of a cow or a sketch of a cow. I might do a value sketch. Um, so it just depends on what I feel I need to do to make the painting a success. If I start getting tight, then I'll do something different. So this is a document that I've put together uh, since our last group, I believe, Carrie Jo. But this is, um, uh, this show, this is just, how many do I have? I've got 12 different preliminary studies that I've illustrated. So there's a NOTAN, there's a value sketch. There's another value sketch, only using a different tool. Um, and the finished painting, um, a gesture, some gesture sketches, um, thumbnail, thumbnail compositional sketches. There's so many different ones, and each one um, is a teacher um, for a different element all right so let's get on to the real painting I'm slipping off my chair here so as i said before this of course is a painting um in progress um, there aren't many layers to this at this point, but it's got enough. I'm trying to get a clip to clip it on the board here. So I'm going to take the masking fluid off. Now this has been on here for a really long time. 
but it it comes right off. I know some people say that you can't leave it on more than a day or two. Um, that's not true. Although I will say, you know, I live in Arizona, so it's pretty dry. Uh, so if you live in a humid environment, that might make a difference. I haven't lived in humidity in so long that I wouldn't be able to tell you, but that kind of makes sense that um, human environment would be different. So I'll leave that on for the time being. So when I do paintings as demonstrations or even uh, on my own with nobody watching, um, and I'm doing them from photos, what I do is um, I'll have um, an ID number. Um, every painting gets an ID number. And then that same ID number goes on the picture. And I take pictures of the process. I'm trying to, somehow they fell to the floor. I'm going <laughs> to dip down here. So these are the 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 pro the progress of this particular painting. So I keep it all together, and then when I go back to painting it, then I have all the all the stuff that I need, including this is why I mentioned it, including the paint, uh, the colors that went into this painting. So this was a demo. So I kept the. Uh, kept to a very, very limited palette of two yellows, two reds, and two blues. So I know what's already in the painting. That that can be very helpful. And let's see, I need... I used quite a bit of paint for that demo. Didn't seem like it, but I did. So the, the paints that I have for that particular painting... I usually try to keep them together. So these are the six colors that went into this painting so I can grab them really fast. So I'm telling you all this because um, what I really have found is that painting is hard. It really is hard. And I've been painting professionally for a bit over 40 years and it's still hard it's not easy and any distractions just don't make it easier so at least i know what color so i'm not distracted by oh dear what color was that i know what colors not that i'm trying to mix the same exact colors i don't i think you can see my by by my background that i like a variegated, um, uh, variegated washes with different nuanced um, mixtures. So I'm not after the same exact color, but I want to know what went into those mixtures. So I'm going to start at the top. You can see how easy it is to make uh, brown with, with primary colors. Now, I don't really want brown, so I'm going to edge it back. I'm going to push it back a little bit more magenta so I have a little bit of variety of color. And, uh, oh, I did talk about light source. This photo was taken on a beautiful day with blue skies but I'm really deep in the canyon so there is no direct sun but I want some direct sun so I'm gonna add the sun so my so I'm going to say that the sun is here shining down here that means that the edge of this tree is going to be catching the light the reason I had masking fluid on these was to make sure I could have some light um, sunlight on the tops of those branches. And let's see, did I use any salt? I don't 
I don't think I did use any salt on this one. If I did use salt, I would want to continue so that that, um, I call, I think of salt as a technique. So that technique would um, be consistent and balanced throughout. And since I've got my sun uh, position settled, then I know that I need to be consistent with that light source. Now, I don't feel like these little twigs need to have light on them. Just so, just the big the big branches. So far, I'm just painting on dry paper. I'll do a little edge softening. In a minute, I'll I'll switch and use a selective wet into wet, just so you can see the difference. So when it comes to technique, um, I use I don't use I don't use um, oh saran wrap. Nothing wrong with it, but. I don't care for it myself, so I don't use it. So what I've, uh, there's a shadow coming off of that one. Um, so what I'm showing you is pretty much it as far as technique. What I do is push the color so that um, my colors are a little more creative than just following the color that was actually there. So I'm hardly ever trying to mix color to match what was actually there. Not right or wrong, it's just what I do. So it looks like I probably need a little, let's put a little, let's drop in a little blue. Little cerulean right there. So now I'm going to switch to selective wet into wet. So that was on dry paper. Um, but anytime you put brush to paper, almost almost any time, you have a decision and an option of wetting the paper first. So now that's wet with clear water. Now I can drop the colors in and just let them spread. When the paper is already wet, it gives you a lot more time to manipulate your washes, a lot more time to work. You don't have to feel as rushed. The paint will only go to that wet, dry edge. You won't go beyond. I mean, if, if I have a big puddle and I hold it, see, even now, it's it that that little drop is just staying right there. I don't know. I don't know if you can see, but that paint will stay inside that wet area. So that's uh, a big part of what makes it a. Um, Gives you more control. So I can continue to add color within those wet areas uh, as long as it's still wet. It will get to a point where it's going to be better um, to wait and let it dry. And the kind of it really comes from experience. Kind of hard to say exactly, um, you know, a formula for when or how. I 
kind of think I'm getting in my right brain because I'm starting to lose the ability to talk, which is a good thing if I'm painting, but maybe not a, such a good thing when I'm demonstrating. So I've worked the color of that trunk down into those twigs and all that flood debris that is caught up uh caught up there since the last flood came through and then when that's dry then I'll do some negative painting to pull it out so you can see all that flood debris so I'm doing the big shape first Now, I've still got masking fluid on these roots, so I can, and I I think the value that the top of this rock was painted the last time I worked on it is probably a, a good value for painting these uh, roots on top. Some of its roots, probably some of it is more flood debris. It's kind of hard to say. Um, but I see some dark, some shadows cast from the branches across that rock. Even though there's no real light source, you can still see some shading. And of course, I have to make a little more so since I... Yeah, I've put some sun in there. I think I want the base value to be a little darker before I put in the negative painting. So I'll just add a little more value. So I would say it's time to see if that um, background is going to carry, or um, I think I put that the wrong way, to see if the branches have enough interest to carry the composition without doing more stuff to the background. Um, Maybe I need to do a little more down here. Let's do a little more shadow before I do that. And I'm still using those same colors. Since the masking fluid is holding the shape of the um, those roots or whatever they are, I can just kind of paint over them. let them dissolve into the plane that faces away from the sun. It's too, too small a brush for the job at hand, so I need to change brushes. Now my eye sees that I'm going to need something to break up this space. So... I'm going to bring out a, a shadow coming over and hope that works. Could be shadows from all sorts of stuff. Nice. I'm thinking this tree will be casting a shadow itself. I want a little bit of the edge of that 
rock to be light. So I'm going to bring that shadow over that way. Maybe this will be casting a little shadow too. Okay, this is now too wet to continue working. Hard to put your hand down on the painting when you've got wet spots. Have to try to work around it a little bit. So again, working on dry paper. But a minute ago, I said Joyce had that option and um, decision to make. <clears throat> regarding wetting the paper first. <clears throat> so that was on dry paper, but you can wet little sections of paper as well. So I'm just gonna put some clear water on this little branch. And then paint into it. Hold it close. Hopefully you can see how the paint is going to just run. Need to get enough. Sometimes you have to encourage it. So it's a, a slightly different look. It's going to be a little bit lighter because the water that's already there is going to dilute the color. You can take the end of the brush and kind of pull out some other little twigs. But it's uh, very uh, useful to know <clears throat> that water seems to be our enemy when we're doing watercolor, but it also is our friend. You just have to be aware of when you can use it and when you have to be careful, et cetera. Well, that got a little bit too big. I don't like, I don't like that. So if I don't like it, it really is kind of disruptive. I'll just blot it out, let it dry, and then go over it later. So if I'm going to do um, branches, I usually will do a little uh, branch and twig study first because I don't, they're not my strong suit. Um, I find they can look so stiff. So you can even add more color to color to color. It doesn't have to be white paper that you paint wet into wet into.
I'm going to switch to an even finer brush. And having a limited palette, too, uh, I find particularly helpful because then I don't have um, that many decisions to make. I just have so many colors. That's it. I already made the decision. So I just do it. When you're doing branches and twigs, you should have overlap. Uh, don't make a fence. So what I mean by a fence, You know, I try to make branches that crisscross. That's not very good, but hopefully you get the idea. Not like this. And not like this. Make sure they some of some of them overlap each other. It makes it look look much more interesting and realistic. Let's see. So um, I'm not a fast painter. The four-step sketch kind of sometimes makes people think I'm a fast painter. Uh, I'm a fast sketcher. I'm not a fast painter. So I have because I have a particular way that I want the painting to look, and it takes um, might not take other people a long time. But it takes me a long time to think things through. And um, to make sure that I um, uh, say what I want to say about the subject matter. Excuse me. So it looks to me like, since this isn't a forest and there's a bunch of twigs right there, probably ought to be some more cast shadows kind of breaking up this trunk. But again, I don't want to make a, a fence with my shadows. Try to keep them, uh, try to keep everything as asymmetrical and uneven as possible. And maybe some up here. Now, <clears throat> I won't be able to finish this. Uh, but I'm trying to show you um, uh, some of the techniques that will go into the whole thing. And one of them is negative painting. So I think this is, it, it may not be quite dry enough, but I think it's dry enough to do a little negative painting in here. So before time totally gets away from me, I do want to do a little negative painting in there. Just to give it some depth, I got a little bit carried away there, didn't it?
I'm going to work that negative painting up into the trunk and out a little bit so it doesn't look so isolated. There's still some masking fluid up there, up in here, which uh, when I take off, it's going to look very, very um, uh, stark. So I'm trying, I need to be a little bit careful and not over finish because I'm, I know I'm going to have to do some adjusting because that white is going to be so very, very white. So um, as I look at the photo, I can see that there's negative painting in here. There are, you know, negative shapes. And then it switches to darker twigs. So I'm going to do a little bit of that. So it's um, about balance. Yeah, balance of technique and weaving them back and forth so that um, everything looks like it goes together. Are we about out of time, Carrie Jo? Well, we've got about an extra five minutes because we started late, sorry. Okay. So you can just add some tips for wrapping up. and. So we didn't really talk about rocks. Um, I showed um, preliminary study, but my favorite one. Uh, some wet on dry, some wet and wet. Talked about light source. A little bit about cast shadows, not too much. Um, Is this the first thing you're going to get the Mastrius, your your group to do? Or would you, do you have that planned yet? No, one, um, well, we don't really know yet uh, if we've got oil painters and watercolor painters mm -hmm. or just oil painters or... Uh, it's going to depend on, um, and we don't know what people want. So I haven't got um, a plan in place at this point. Okay, so we get to direct the class. Yes, ma'am, you do. Um, so I've got one rock here that hasn't been started. You can, I think I've got time to start on a rock. <clears throat> um this rock already has its base coat. This rock had a base coat and then I added to it with the cast shadows, et cetera. Matter of fact, I think I might need to do a little lifting here because that tree, lifting is a big part of what I do. That tree, if it casts a shadow this way, it's gonna cast it this way. Probably need to see a little bit of the edge of that cast shadow. I hope that made sense. Now you can see I, I'll have to work on it a little bit more. Um, but for, as far as a rock, that one's a little more on the blue side. So I'm going to put a base coat for the rock. Always keeping the tops of the rocks uh, light. 
not necessarily white because we don't want to compete with the white water. So this rock is in front of the waterfall and it's in front of this other rock that's um, right here. So while it's still wet, I'll start modeling it. Bring it right up to the, next to that rock. Making variegated color. Let it come on down here into that shadowy area. It's going to be a little smooshy down in here because it's all uh, shadowy back in there. So I'm just going to smoosh the colors around, knowing that later I'll be coming back in with more negative painting and <clears throat> bringing those uh, lights out. So more negative painting behind these roots or whatever they happen to be. And then this rock, <clears throat> will be darker around the top of this rock. So I would think that from this, you could probably tell that I spend quite a bit of time getting the drawing correct. Hang around a few little grasses that are sticking down there. And when I know I don't have time to finish an area, like right now, I know I don't have time to deal with that. So because I don't have time, I'll just use a um, edge softening technique to make a soft edge out of that so that I can come back later and do whatever needs to be done without having uh, hard edged washes in weird, weird shapes that will make up, give me some grief. Maybe bring a little bit of that into that rock. This rock has a little a little notch taken out of it, so I'll paint that in. It might actually be too uh, wet for me to do much with that right now. So of course the rule of thumb is if you if you want um, crisp edges and no uh, with um, with definition of shape, then you're going to need to let everything dry. But if you want it to smush together, then you don't need to let it dry. You can just let it um, you can let everything smush together. Depends on what you're after. It looks like it needs to be a little darker right there. And if it looks a little dry and too <clears throat> tight, I'll just put a big drop of water in it and let it let it smoosh around. So right now, this kind of looks like an egg. Uh, but when it's all dry and I go and I start modeling that rock by having by darkening the planes that are facing away from the light, uh, that will help that shape to look. Uh, 
rockier. So there's a lot that still needs to be done to this. Um, one thing I didn't show you tonight uh, is negative splatter. And I think we, I don't think we have time. I'll just show you that that's negative splatter. And I use negative splatter here to push this back to have this foliage come forward. Um, but that would be something that would take um, another, I don't know, half hour, I suppose, to show. So, yeah. 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 We'll definitely, yeah, definitely do that in class. And um, I've probably taken up more than the five minutes. But even at this uh, early stage, it's helpful to put a mat around it so you can get a better idea of the painting as it might look if you do this, that, or the other thing. Um, like I said, I'm hoping that if I continue these branches, you can see in the picture how they really extend out. And they're very interesting shapes. I won't put all of them in. But if I extend those branches, um, finish the rocks, maybe a little splatter for texture. I kind of think that um, that will hold the composition. And by that, I mean have it look like it's uh, not, you know, unfinished. Uh, but only time and more work will tell. Cool. I'm going to go down to my creek and look at it differently. I'm going to look at it in terms of just block shapes and color and see if I can. And if you have my if you have my book or my chapter on the subject, um, it shows how I break the creek itself down or a, a creek, you know, a water cascade, a waterfall break it down into simple shapes that make it a lot easier to draw and paint. And that is, is that your book with oil painting or do you have a different one for watercolor? Um, or? That would be, I believe it's in both. Um, so let's see, I have a chapter, a standalone chapter that's uh, devoted to that topic. Um, but Part of it is in this book. This is my watercolor book called Watercolor Unleashed. It's available. It's no lot if it, if you get it in a hard copy, it's probably going to be a, a second hand. Um, but it is available as a digital, you know, a Kindle or an ebook from Penguin Random House and Amazon. But anyway, here's where the way I break the creek down into its simple components. I call it the anatomy of a, a waterfall. So this one was a little bit uh, further along. You can see um, the, the simple shape here, the simple shape with a little fancy treatment at the edge to get the water to splash up. Awesome. So when I paint white water in watercolor, I don't paint the water. I'm painting everything but the white, but the white water. That's a negative painting um, situation. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So now everybody just has to join and come to the class. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, painting is um, my favorite thing. I think painting is fun, but it does require a, a commitment um, you know, it's, it is a lot of work, but it's fun work and it's challenging. And I think if you are a person who paints, you're the kind of person that thrives on challenge. So, um, yeah, I hope people will join us. Awesome. I can't wait to start. This is going to be fun. Thank you so much, Julie. Oh, well, thank you, Carrie Jo. Okay. Have a good night and we'll talk. Oh, thank you. You too. Okay. Bye.